The team at Shupel, led by Ed, helps organizations and business connect and collaborate using their tenancy hosted software solution, in addition to the industry leading products like WordPress and Drupal. Ed is a political science graduate of Texas A&M University, an Army brat, a family man, and has over 15 years of experience running companies. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you, Ed Schupel. Thank you, Jason, and uh, thank you as well, Alice. This is what's going on right now in Haiti on a much more somber note. So what you're seeing here is, uh, this is the presidential palace in the background collapsed. And this, these are the Haitians literally camping here. Uh, due to a series of random events, my mother actually lives in Dominica, which is a small island in the West Indies. And what's interesting is there are people there, and they have no power, and they have no running water. They have a community bathroom in some cities, but everybody has a mobile device. And there's been all these emergent behaviors. So if you go fishing, and fishing in Dominica means you fish and you get fish, it's not like you're like, I'm only going to take the red snapper, right? I mean, you just go fishing. Well, when you come back in, you can actually text into the, sh into the shore to see where the people are buying at a particular market. So whether you go into this cove or you go into that cove is literally dependent upon the fact of how people text and communicate back to you on a mobile device. So it's, and is anybody in here not have a cell phone? So we're 100%, right? Now we're gonna talk about that too because a lot of this stuff is slightly new. First, we're gonna talk about the mobile web. We're going to talk about how to utilize it, and we're going to talk about who's using it, and along the way we're going to have plenty of snark, and we're going to have a lot of comments. Um, and I read a great book, and I want you to think about this in the beginning. I read a great book earlier this year called Absolute Honesty. Has anyone in here read it? It's, it's an amazing book, because one of the things that we do as a people is we tend to, we, we tend to not like saying excuses, right? But what I discovered in the book was that I was pre-excusing myself. So I would say, I talk too fast, and I would tell you this ahead of time, and then I would talk too fast, and I felt okay, because I had warned you, right? I had warned you. Now, in the advertising industry, how many of you guys are pre-excusing yourselves on technology? I'm not good at tech. You pre-excuse yourselves frequently. Oh, that's Bob's job. That's not my generation. And so I would challenge you to, to set aside those thoughts. If you're pre-excusing a weakness in technology or pre-excusing yourself of a weakness in mobile, I want you to just stop. Just stop and, and today absorb because I think a lot of the stuff is stuff that you can do. And one of the goals that I have is to make sure you feel empowered in how to make these changes. How many of you guys find cell phones stressful? None of you. How many of you guys have kids who text at the dinner table and it pisses you off. Anybody? Show a hand, seriously. When those young people break out the text. How many people here text at the dinner table and find it annoying that old people tell you not to? <laughs> All right? And interestingly enough, from up here, it's not necessarily age divided. And here's why I bring this up. This is Cro-Magnon Man. And this is the book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. It's a phenomenal book if you like uh, anthropology and really long reads and you know, walks in the park. Um, Cro-Magnus, and we refer to it as the Great Leap Forward, which is 50,000 years ago, 40,000 years ago is when we became upright mobile creatures. And if you go back to that time, they all had tools and jewelry. So for the last 50,000 years, Alice, you would have had one of two things. You would have had something of value, arrowheads, tools, jewelry, and a method of accessing something of value. You would have a hiding place or a key. We go along, and these are the only two things. Sure, hunters are going to have weapons, and fishermen are going to have their fishing gear, but the rest of us are just going to have these two devices. And suddenly, from an anthropology perspective, for the first time, there's a third device. So you guys just told me as a group that you do not find cell phones stressful, but we as a people have not had time to evolve. I was speaking to a church group of about 150 kids, and I was making the adults be quiet because the adults were actually more rambunctious than the kids. And I, and I asked the same question, how many of you guys like to text at the table? And then, you know, how many of the parents dislike it? And the parents were like, oh, yeah, you know, well, Johnny's pissing me off, you know? And so then I said, I said to the kids, what do you do? What do you do, honestly? What do you do? And their answer to me was, I avoid having dinner with my parents. I avoid having dinner with my parents. We literally are at a point where the children are so sociologically adapted, anthropologically adapted to the cell phone device that they will choose their culture 
almost over their family. Let me give you another way. When the computers came out in the 80s, which is really kind of when they got on mainstream, it was the first time the technology went backwards. It was the first time the kids taught the parents, right? I mean, if you went back 50 years, it wasn't like the eight-year-old was coming out and going, look, Dad, it's a plow. How hard could it be? I mean, that's not how it went. It went from the parents down. It always went from the older generation to the younger generation. And with the advent of computers, it's the first time it went backward. Well, that was kind of a big deal. But it wasn't the end of the world. It was just how to do stuff, right? I still can't assemble something from Ikea. I need my daughter to tell me how. Once I've done it once, I will know how. But, but what's happening with cell phones is it's forming a new culture. Facebook's a new culture. So first it was technology going backwards. Now, now they've got a new culture and they're trying to teach us their culture and we're learning it. So that's, again, that's the first time in the history of the world. That's the first time in the history of the world that a culture is going backwards. The young are teaching the old. And that's kind of a big deal. How long does it take us to adapt to these things? It takes 25 years. It takes 25 years for new technology to work its way into a society. And we're about 15 years in. Now this is the part where you're like, wow, I hadn't thought of it that way. Because if you think it through this way, it, it both presents some serious problems, but also some amazing opportunities. I mean, the Model T was amazing. It had all these options. It came in black. That was it. And it could get away with it. And the iPhone, when it came out, was the only touchscreen one, multi-touch, and it could get away with it. But it quickly evolved. So we're, let's say cell phones kind of came out mid-90s was when you could really afford them, right? And back then you had the bag or the brick, right? I love watching old Miami Vice. Don Johnson looks so sexy with that phone, doesn't he? He's got his shirt undone. He's working the cell phone. Um, so we've come a long way, and now we can afford the devices. But again, 15 years in, so we have another 10 years of innovation ahead. How do you, how do you decide what you're going to do? When you're going to, when you're going to buy a computer, what do you do? I mean, there's a couple people know who here feels completely comfortable making all their computer buying decisions by themselves and doesn't ask anybody. All right, maybe a quarter of you. The rest of you guys, you ask somebody, don't you? You ask somebody. You ask a dweeb. You ask one of the nerds who knows all about it, right? You know, in, in our culture, geek is no longer an insult. It's like, it's, it's a compliment. You ask them. And in the book, Tipping Point, by Malcolm Gladwell, he refers to three different people that are required to have something tip over and become significant. And they are, you need a salesperson who is basically spreading knowledge. You need a connector, and the connector is the woman who, you know, is a stay-at-home mom and then gets a master's degree and then starts working in the executive world and then retires and then has a job on the board here and is also an artist and she can connect you with everybody from, you know, an 18-year-old skater to, you know, uh, the Bass family, right? And the, those are the connectors and we need those people. We all know them. And by the way, for the, who's a, who here in the audience is a connector? Who are the big connectors here? There's one there. Okay, I'm going to help you guys out. There's no business model being a connector. Um, it's, it's great to connect, but you've got to find ancillary revenue, and a lot of that goes with the, with the technology. Salespeople, salespeople, we need you too, but we tend to yell at you. Salespeople, no, we do, we do. We've got that one person in our agency who, when somebody says a good idea, they email it out to everybody, and then you're like, damn, they stole my idea. You know? But you were the selfish one that wasn't sharing the idea with everybody. The salesperson's got this compulsion, compulsion to automatically inform of every, everybody. What they don't necessarily do is give you proper credit. So find that person in your organization who, like, who you think is stealing ideas, pull them aside and teach them how to give proper credit to where the idea came from, where the concept came from, because you need that salesperson inside your organization and outside your organization. But the third one is the maven. The maven is the one who is so compelled to share information, like, like I'm a maven. If I find out something new and cool, I have to tell you. I have to tell you. And if you were to come back and say, well, that was great advice on the PC, here's five bucks, Ed. That's just gonna piss me off. I mean, right, it's five dollars, that's not enough. It's not on the record, I wasn't asking for five dollars. But you actually pay mavens back because they obsessive compulsively have these databases in their mind. So the way you pay a maven back is you say, you know that advice you gave me on which phone to buy? That was the right one. Or, hey, I signed up with Verizon and it doesn't work in my area. I mean, that's how you pay a Maven back, because you're compiling that database.